Welcome to Designer Wednesday. First of all, I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phones, please. Designer Wednesday is sponsored by the San Francisco Design Center, ASID, DTRA, San Francisco, um, I'm sorry, California Homes Magazine, San Francisco Cottages and Gardens Magazine. I'd like to introduce Justin Tucker, the Regional Director for Schumacher. Justin would like to say a few words. Justin. Thank you. Uh, hi, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today. Uh, this is our glorious brand new Schumacher showroom. Um, if you've been around for a while, you know that many years ago, many moons ago, we did have our own showroom and we just felt like right now was the time for us to strike and come forward with another showroom. Um, it's a little different than anything we've done before. It's a brand new concept for us. So we'd love for you to check it out after the um, presentation is over. Um, love to hear your thoughts and feedback. Uh, we've got Kyle and Myrna in the back as our San Fran dream team. Um, and enjoy the show. <laughs> Thank you, Tucker. <laughs> oh, and. <laughs> And if you dropped your business card into um, the fish tank outside, we will be raffling off um, two sets of pillows. We'll do two drawings for them. Um, there are Mary McDonald Puka Diamond fabric. And if you didn't get a chance to drop your business card in, don't forget right when it's over. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for this afternoon, Alf Nusifora. Alf is chairman and founder of the Luxury Marketing Council chapter of Northern California, embracing San Francisco, Carmel, Monterey, Silicon Valley, Napa, and Sonoma. The Luxury Marketing Council is a global organization representing more than 1,000 of the world's leading consumer brands. A native of Brisbane, Australia, Alf entered the advertising and marketing business on the corporate side, working for two Fortune 500 companies, first in Australia and then in the United States. He then made the move to advertising business and later advanced to agency management. Alf graduated from the University of Queensland with a BA degree. He furthered his formal education in the United States, attending the Harvard Business School where he earned an MBA degree. Please welcome Alf. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you down the back, we have seats. We still have a few seats in the front here. One of them has a $1,000 bill under it, so <laughs> just come on down and see if you can find the bill. Um, it, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. We're going to have a, a great session. I, first of all, I want to uh, acknowledge um, the person I term the sort of the supreme commander of the San Francisco Design Center, Rhonda Harada. Rhonda, please wave. Rhonda has, has got this Designer Wednesday series going and it's become very, very popular and, and hopefully you'll see why again today when we get through today's discussion. Um, the, the, pro the protocol and the format today is very simple. We'll get the panel going. Uh, we've got some questions to get them sort of ignited and, and combustible. And then from time to time I will throw to the audience. So please don't be shy. Uh, the time goes very, very quickly. So if you've got a question, throw the hand up and ask it. Let me introduce the panel in alphabetical order. Sid Baxter is the principal of S.A. Baxter, uh, general contractor. Sid earned his uh, bachelor's degree in English from the University of Georgia, but found its meaningful implementation somewhat uh, more elusive. Uh, a chance encounter on the shoulder of I-40 in North Carolina led him to California, where he secured a position on a large construction project in Pacific Grove, commanding a commanding salary of $5 an hour. Uh, Sid liked the work, and three years, uh, uh, three focused years later, he had become one of the lead carpenters on a $13 million remodel that was featured in Architectural Digest. Since, since 1999, Sid has collaborated with many of the industry's most talented design professionals, orchestrating hundreds of remodeling projects for the Bay Area's most discerning homeowners. Would you please join me in welcoming Sid Baxter? Sid. Nancy Evers, in 2011, uh, Nancy Evers and Demetra Anderson joined forces to create Evers uh, and Anderson Interior Design, a full-scale luxury interior design firm located in Silicon Valley. Together with the help of their dedicated team, they designed thoughtful residential spaces, applying their expertise in interior architecture, custom furniture design, perspective drawings, 
material sourcing and art consultation. Uh, Evers and Anderson has quickly become a sought over after design firm in the San Francisco Bay Area with projects spanning uh, San Francisco, the peninsula, Napa Valley, and Lake Tahoe. And their work has been featured in several local and national publications in addition to both the 2015 and 16 San Francisco Decorated Showcase Houses. Please join me in, Mansing, in welcoming Nancy. James Hunter has been a valued member of the Wiseman Group design team since 1996. He knows Paul Wiseman's thinking better than uh, anyone else on the staff, probably better than Paul, for that matter. Uh, early in his career, James worked as a fabricator of custom soft goods. As a result, he was able to observe firsthand the work of many top interior design firms. He has managed his own a design company for several years before joining the Wiseman Group team. Uh, James also owns a farm in northern Michigan where he regularly spends time. The, the, the area did not vote Trump, correct? Um, the change of pace and shift in culture, a Bay Area to rural Michigan, urban to country, uh, provide a boost to his creativity and further his appreciation of context in design. Please join me in welcoming uh, James. It's like dealing with rock stars. <laughs> John Toyer, architect John Toyer, graduated from Iowa State in 1993. A former partner of Ike Kligerman, Barclay Architects, he now heads up his own Toyer studio and John focuses on modern architecture built on close collaboration and passion for traditional craftsmanship. His mission is improving life through good design. Please join me finally welcoming John, John Toyer. So James, let's start with you, panel. I want to ask the same question all four of you, very, very briefly. Headlines, just headlines, 25 words or less. Tell us a little bit about what you do and the and the company or the, the firm you work with. James, start with you. So, uh, it's working? Yes. Uh, design principal at the Wiseman Group. I've been with the Wiseman Group almost 21 years. Uh, like many people here, my path to interior design was a little bit uh, indirect. I started with a master's in art education. I followed that with um, an interest in uh, um, design and eventually did my own apartment after leaving a business job and somebody said, oh, that looks pretty good and then they asked me to help them with their house and I did that and before you know it, I turned it into a job. So I kind of, what I realized was um, interior design is a lot like prostitution. For, you know, the, the first time, well, the first time you do it for as, fun. As profitable? <laughs> the first time you do it for fun, the second time you do it for free and the next time you do it for money, right? Yeah. <laughs> And, and my pimp is here today, Paul Wiseman, the founder of the Wiseman Group. <laughs> what projects you're working on today, sorts of projects, uh, what's your actual, your, 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 your role within the Wiseman Group today? Uh, so my role in the Wiseman Group, I'm a principal, so I lead projects. Our firm is very collaborative, so we work together. I work with Paul in projects and also independently with my team, uh, which is composed of Associate design principals, uh, design, senior designers, uh, designers, and assistant designers. We've got some amazing jobs um, we're working on. Actually, this week my team's not here because we're doing an installation in Seacliff. Um, however, we've got a really important project in Atherton with Frank Geary. We're doing a project in an Eshrick home in Hillsboro with um, Richard Beard Architects. We were working on one of um, Ricardo Lagretta's last projects. We are hopefully starting soon with a longtime client, a project with Jim Jennings here in the Bay Area in Sonoma. Um, so it's a, a roster of really amazing opportunities. Okay. Sid, what about you? Um, Microphone. Microphone. Thank you. Ours is a small, uh, one major project at a time uh, company. And uh, we're the only builders we're aware of in the Bay Area uh, who guarantee the quality of their workmanship for life. Uh, we also have fully transparent accounting and estimating. So from day one, we establish a clear relationship of trust with our clients. There's never any wondering if the contractor's padding the bill. It's all on the table in black and white. Um, and that's proven very important for us. We've also had the privilege of working with the Wiseman Group on a couple of projects. And it was the, the first time that, we, that I began to realize the value of good design as opposed to just architecture and the good shape of a home was on a project with, with the Wiseman Group. And we'd worked and we'd worked and we'd worked and we'd put in all this baseboard and we finally got the tour of the home when we were finished from the homeowner. And I can still, like the hair on my arms is still standing up now, walking through and realizing all of the work we'd done that didn't make sense to us at that point was all cohesive 
it all made sense, it didn't hit you over the head, and that was when I realized what good design was. And so your business is basic remodel, correct? It's, it's all remodel. Right. No. That's right. Okay. We do we do the occasional ground up project, but most of our work is in San Francisco and Tiburon, uh, some Palo Alto, Los Altos, and there's other than Los Altos, there's not much in the way of vacant lots. Mm -hmm. So we we're, we're remodelers first okay. and foremost. Nancy, what about you? Um, well, I kind of had. <coughs> You're on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I kind of had the same path to interior design as well. I was um, working in PR and marketing for several years in New York and then Denver and then made my way out here and was with um, Yahoo for six years. Um, and then uh, my husband and I decided to um, build a home and through that process, again, sort of got the bug and went through a couple uh, friends' houses for free and then just sort of built my business from there. And then about seven years ago, um, my business partner, Demetra and I were down in um, LA together for a mutual friend's birthday. And uh, we just started talking. Everyone went shopping, clothes shopping, and we went to La Cienega. And the idea sort of came from there. So we've been busy um, building our business for the last seven years. Um, we mostly work on um, remodels or new builds down in the peninsula. Uh, we currently have a project in uh, Martis that we're working to um, up in Tahoe to hopefully install at the end of May. Um, we have a couple projects in Hillsboro that we're working on and, uh, and Menlo Park is big for us as well. Uh, we also recently, um, actually about three weeks ago, launched a, um, a furniture line called Moxie Made, uh, which is all upholstery, couches, sectionals, chairs, ottomans, dining chairs. Um, so that's been a fun new you know, revenue stream for us, but also we're really excited about designing uh, furniture. Excellent. John, what about you? Um, unlike you guys who sort of stumbled into the, uh, the profession, uh, I feel like I grew up in it. My, some of my earliest memories are being on the Acropolis with my parents, and, and my father was an architect, so we were just always, um, when I grew up in Chicago, so we were always just traveling the sort of uh, the Midwest, looking at the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings in the area and things like that. And I actually sort of rebelled by becoming an architect because my father was like, oh no, you cannot become an architect. And so I was studying everything else and then um, ended up coming around to it because it just felt right and it just made sense to me. Um, uh, early in my career, uh, about four years in, I ended up uh, taking a job and moving to New York to work for Ike Clickerman Barclay Architects, thinking it would just be a, um, a one year, two year sort of stint, a little landing pad job, um, because I wasn't really interested in traditional architecture at all. And um, I just was dazzled. I, 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 within six months, I was running a, a project that was a 12,000 square foot uh, home on Long Island that was a sort of, you know, English shingle house. And I just had so much fun detailing all of this. Um, this house like one big cabinet that I just got hooked and uh, since then I've actually been kind of gravitating back towards more contemporary work uh, in terms of what I see up to do. So. Panel question to all of you. Um, I want to talk about the client. So let's start with the client today. How is the client changing? Last two to three years, certainly coming out of post-recession, uh, what, what have you noticed in terms of their just their behavior, the way they the way they think, what they want, what they demand. Stop, stop with you. James. What, what are you noticing? So I think the first thing is uh, clients are younger. They have more resources at an earlier age. So they're clients with families and they're tech savvy. They're online. Uh, they're looking at things all the time. And design... What are, they do, what are they doing professionally? Where are they coming from professionally? A lot of clients come from uh, money management backgrounds, either you know, Morgan Stanley type places, uh, things like that. So we see a lot of clients uh, with resources from those backgrounds. Couples that both worked and then maybe they're now, um, one's working and one's not, they're raising their family. So how are they behaving? What, what's the change? I think the biggest change that we're seeing is, um, given that they're younger, they're also looking at the projects as not being um, as long term. Um, we used to look at a project that the clients were doing that home and they're planning to stay there forever and now their young families are growing and they might be making decisions based on the fact that um, their lifestyles will change as they evolve. Panel, what else? Build on that. You see? From a, like, we're seeing clients do projects that ordinarily would have been purely quality of life. Like you're investing a lot of money in details or design 
that may or may not be quite as saleable in resale. For instance, we have a young client. He's I don't know if he's tw I don't know if he's 30 years old yet. Sweatpants, zip up jacket, and he's managed to retain Stanley Sadowitz as his architect, and he's doing this as a flip home. And that's, I mean, we're, that's unprecedented. We've never seen that before. So, so the point is? Well, the point is that it seems like there just is more, the, the, younger, the younger clients seem to be more short-sighted, maybe, but they seem to have more disposable income than we're accustomed to having. Nancy, you, you would. Yeah, and I can build upon that, too, and also what James was saying. We have um, two clients that um, recently sold their tech companies for a lot of money, and yet, this is the first time that they're working with a designer, or this is the first time they've seen, um, a thought about applying money towards interior design. So it's it's very different from um, maybe a little bit older demographic who's maybe this might be their second home, or they've or they've grown up with parents who you know have beautifully designed homes. These are this is the first time that they're buying a home, and so it's a little bit of managing time because they want everything immediately. Um, and also style as well, and just helping them curate a style. Are you educating them more? You have to educate them, James? Yes, so that's a big part of what we do. We educate clients. That's a huge part about, of our job. About what? What are the basics that you're educating these people about? Quality, uh, the difference no, well, in something. But quality means line. what? I mean, quality is, what, what does that mean? Quality is worth waiting for. Craftsmanship. Yep. Yeah. Those are still... They're amorphous terms. How do you, I'm a buyer and I'm in front of you right now. Show me what quality means. What, what does craftsmanship mean? A lot of clients don't understand that the things that they're purchasing are made by somebody somewhere. Mm -hmm. And in the work that we do, so much of it not only is custom, but there is somebody making that thing and it might have many different hands handling it. Do they respond to that? They do. They need to see the process, and, and I think that by bringing them to, uh, say, a, a, a work show, a, a workroom where people are, you know, carving wood, or they're, you know, they have all their, their tools going, and they can sort of explain the process, and um, having sort of humanizing that experience for them gets them to appreciate not only the work, the, the workmanship itself, what they're getting in their home, but also it, it humanizes and it helps them understand who's involved, and to whatever degree you can make them part of the team, um, I think it really helps helps the process. How would you make them part of the team? I think that um, if, you, if you get them involved in, in, in sort of pouring through samples of, of, of things, uh, let's say, or um, touring projects that have been done, and get them to focus on things that they enjoy and get them to um, it, it, it respond by bringing that into the project um, and let it be them that sort of leads that to some degree. Even if you have to sort of build a, build a case where they, they can't make a wrong choice, uh, if they choose that, if they choose any one of them, they can't lose. It's their choice. And, but it's their choice and then they're more invested and they're, they're, they tend to be a little more open about the time. Sid, you were going to say something? It can be a hard sell, though, and I think it's an unusual young new money client who's willing to actually listen to you when you're, when you're trying to educate them on what quality is and what quality means and why it's worth waiting for and why it's worth paying we'll for. Will they buy the because argument? Because they're, so, you know, they're so accustomed to finding that thing or an ancillary of that thing online yeah. and expecting it yesterday. Yeah, that the, the photos the are cell... already there. It looks complete. They think yeah. it's. They think right. it's You just instant. make my room look exactly like that room. Like, like buying I'd rather a new, not. Buying so, a new say that again, Nancy. What, what they they, where, they'll pull up a picture from Pinterest right. and say, um, you know, I'd like my room to look exactly like this room. I, I'd say I, I'd like it to not. I mean, it would maybe <laughs> a similar paint color or yeah. What is it about that room? Um, and then also, I was uh, away this weekend and my client sending me Pinterest pictures. Well, should we do the open shelving around the side? And I'm saying, let everything in the kitchen have its moment. You're, you're on Pinterest too much. And she's like, no, I have this love-hate relationship with Pinterest. But don't I you want that feedback? Oh, don't I, you want them to say, here, I, I saw this, I yes. like it. I saw this, I like it. For Give inspiration. Me some ver right, exactly, for inspiration. Some version of that. Yeah. But you've got that to, helps, you've got to carefully helps. establish the line of who's driving the bus. Exactly, right? yeah. 
But we let, we let clients know right in the initial interview that it's a process, not a product, and the relationship with the client is really important, and we're gonna do something that's going to meet their needs, it will inspire their life, and also set new expectations for how they live. And once they start to realize that the process is important, that relationship, and it's not about the end result as much as how we get there and make something beautiful for them, we get a lot of buy-in on that. We're short on time already, so I wanna, I wanna hit you with some specific questions. Are they more cost conscious? Are they, are they more budget conscious? We, I mean, we have, our clients run the gamut. We have very um, budget conscious clients and others. But they're not like, nickel and diming. Some are. Some are. For, for, our, for us, yeah. When they are. nickel and dime, where do they nickel and dime? Um, if they're building a house, it's when they get to the furniture. So they've spent all their money already. <laughs> So we, we run into that, well, maybe I should wait on this rug or should wait on this couch or can you show me a $3,000 couch and not an $8,000 couch, you know? Uh, so, so that happens How, how are you dealing with, well, I would say that they, they nickel and dime on anything that they can't see. Yeah. So such you know, as structure, foundation. Uh, <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah, you know. All the other no, no. non-essential stuff. Just the opposite, yeah. I feel like. What we tell all our clients that the, the, the rough end costs what it costs. They can find another builder whose labor rates may be a few dollars an hour more or less, but in the end, the bones of the structure, the framing of the structure, everything but the fixtures and finishes, that's pretty much a fixed cost. It is what it is. And where they have tremendous control over the price is in the fixtures and finishes, and that's when you start getting nickeled and dimed. <laughs> But we let but, clients but they know do, they do try to drive. They do try to drive those conversations early, early on, and try to see where we can, right. where we can and, save. And, and, and we want and, that, right? Yes. We want to work with them to find the most value in every aspect of the project. Right. Jamie, the clients are always looking to value engineer a project, whether it's on the building side, the architecture side, the design side, and we provide a budget for a client, and we take into account that they might be a mix of um, retail items, showroom items, custom items, and we let them know what things are most important in setting the tone for a space, and I think that's how we can manage those client expectations around budget. And when they see that, then they, you get them to come along with the decision making, and they're not questioning every dollar and cent. James, let me stay with you. On the issue of time, they want it faster now. They're used to watching it on HGTV where they can get it turned around in 24 hours. How are you responding to that? Uh, that's a difficult one. Um, we, we do the best we can. We try to um, under-promise and over-deliver, but we are not the kind of firm that can do a whole house in six months. It doesn't work that way. Um, and we try to set those expectations early on with the client. And what happens when they, when they don't like what they hear? Well, we give clients the option to phase, do projects in phases, to focus on certain areas and do other things later. And um, we try to manage their expectations in a way that um, if time is that issue, then, you know, like Paul always says you get three things. Time, three things for a good project. Um, money, taste, and time, but you only get two. Right. So if they want to do it quickly, then they're going to pay a lot more money. <laughs> Nancy, same question to you. How are you managing the time argument? Um, well, I was going to say, I, I agree a lot with what James is saying. Um, we've run into a situation recently over the holidays where we actually had to tell the client that we, we can no longer work, work with you. Your expectations are so high. You know, wanting a kitchen done kitchen remodel in three weeks while they're at their other home in um, Palm Springs, me manage it all over the holidays, and then, but not pay me that much. So um, after many go-arounds and many go-arounds, I just think, no, I just don't think we're right fit. So, and we have to make those decisions for our firm to run smoothly, for our quality of life. Um, so sometimes it's hard decisions like that. You have to walk. Yep. One more question on the client, then I wanna move on to the relationship angles. Um, Think for a second about a recent unreasonable client. Right? That was the, one. The, the spawn, <laughs> the spawn of Satan. So I want to know, and I assume you still have the client. You decided not to walk. You decided to stay in management because the money was too good, yeah, yeah. right? Let's start with you, James. Uh, without naming the client, what was the situation, and how did you manage? Well, we're doing something a little unusual. Our firm is um, primarily residential, but we're working on a commercial job right now. And the commercial arena is completely different, as well as the uh, number of decision makers or lack of a key decision maker. So the process is a lot longer. We can't 
get a decision in a timely fashion. We set expectations, say we have a decision by this date, you can have it by that date. When we get into the situation where they finally make a decision and they expect a really quick turnaround, we sometimes have to build into that conversation early on that you may need a temporary fixture or to meet inspection or whatever it is because to get this, it takes that. Okay. Sid, what about you? Unreasonable situation. Well, we, we, we do our best to vet clients very carefully before we sign up. Yeah, but you got a bad one. But, mm. right, and often the, the personality quirks, if you would call them that, right. only come out, you know, right. uh, once you're well into the project. So what we do in that situation is we rely upon, largely, upon our architect to fulfill what I view as their ultimate calling, which is to act not only as, as, as someone who draws the shape of the building and articulates the client's wishes, but to be the arbiter and the intermediary between homeowner and contractor. You throw it to the architect. We don't throw it to but the I mean, architect, you, but, but we look to them for right. guidance, and the best ones are right there with us. We send our change orders, every one of them, to the architect for their review prior to its being sent to the homeowner so they can weigh in and say that if it's fair or not. So whenever there's a dispute and, you know, if there's ever an issue that's clearly our fault, we, we cop to it and we, we address it. But it's the architect's role, ideally, to be the arbiter and make sure both parties are being treated fairly. Nancy? We had, we had a difficult client uh, last year and uh, across the board, the, the contractor, the lighting contractor, the landscaper, I mean, we're all kind of in the same boat where kind of being treated in this condescending way and um, nothing was quite um, perfect in their eyes. And so um, actually a lot of, um, a lot of reassuring and uh, just like holding each other up um, conversations with the contractor and architect and all of parties involved. We'd call each other and kind of vent and um, we're all sort of in it together. Uh, but in that case from, from trying to manage the client was over communication. Like we just felt like it was our job as difficult as they were. It just seemed like the more we could communicate with them, the, the more that we were able to calm them down. So um, as much as we wanted to just run, um, we couldn't, we were half pregnant on the so, job. So the answer for you was, was over communicate. And then just vent with, with communication. Com 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 comrades in, right. uh, um, in the project. All right, what about you, John? Um, I, had a, I had a client who had unreasonable expectations going into a project, and I think um, I was not, um, I, I sort of took, took the challenge up, and, and it was uh, too much house, too little money, and it was a, a builder I hadn't, I hadn't vetted, and she decided to take on the, the, the role of try, trying to force the marriage. Um, between me and the builder, and it was it was a real real challenge, and and she was she was formidable. How did you solve it? Um, I I tried to um, get them them actually together, and to try to um, force him to sort of see the kind of quality um, that I was I was sort of expecting to bring to it, and then um, have her sort of sign off on that, and and come up with more simplified ways of. Of doing those um, those details and and resolving it in a way that was, she was going to be able to afford, but she was she was a bad she was a tough one. Yeah. So so to the panel, quick wrap up here. The, the 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 keys to controlling the client. I'm hearing a lot of communication. Don't ever leave them in the dark. Yep. I'm hearing Sid say, bring the architect in, right, as a sort of the leader. To, to provide some, some bomb, James? Well, usually, I mean, I think we have really great clients and I don't think we have any difficult clients and I think the reason for that is if you start to see something go on that path, you have to try and understand, we're part psychologists, understand where that's coming from. Yeah. And once you understand it, you can reset those expectations. And I had a client where we used to have to tell her, we're gonna be doing this on the agenda a week in advance. And then the day of the meeting, these are the five things on the agenda. And then during the meeting, we would say, we have an hour left, we still have two more things and, and on what, the agenda. What, what were you doing there? What were you doing there? Managing the client's expectations and keeping them uh, informed and aware of what was needed and necessary. And peace for the client, yes? Uh, yeah. yeah. Questions from the audience on the client before we move on? Questions? This is your last chance. Never be able to ask a question again. Yes, Kevin. The question is, repeat the question. Uh, 
how uh, our furniture line is being integrated into the rest of our services. Um, we were originally launching it as a separate brand. We have trade pricing and we're marketing to designers as well, so we felt like perhaps we should have it separate, but the more research that we're doing and the uh, meetings that we're having with distributors this week um, and last week, we feel like they're wanting to hear more about the design expertise that we're bringing um, to the line, and so it makes more sense to talk about our um, experience and, and on the design side. Um, and then, oh, I just had another point I was gonna make. Um, um, oh, I lost it, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> um, yes, it actually has, um, um, we're incorporating with current clients and then uh, we're also doing um, for um, for customers who are not working with just designers um, going to their home for like a free hour consultation so we did that and then ended up with an entire home project for the design side so we feel like it's definitely complimentary yeah questions down the back How do you vet your clients so you know which ones you want to accept and not accept quickly, James? So many of our clients are referrals from another client. So there's a sort of an internal vetting process that already occurs. You, you and trust then, them. And then we meet them. Okay. Sid? The same. We, we long ago stopped uh, using SEO and promoting our Google page listings because the cold calls and referrals we get just randomly from the internet Bottom, you know, lowest common denominator, just kicking tires. It's referrals, of course, where the best uh, clients come from, and they have already, to a certain extent, passed that screening process. However, and then we do meet with them. We develop a budget with them, sometimes for a year or more before we ever will sign a construction contract. And during that time, typically, you get a good sense of whether or not you want to work with them or you'll be compatible. You don't always know. We have a husband and wife client right now, and mid-project, we've been told we are not to speak with the wife about the project at all. And so it's, it's, it's challenging. Sometimes you, don't, you, you, you can't predict it. Yeah. Nancy? And we're the same. We, we, real, we mostly go on referrals, and those are the ones that we find to be most successful. Um, and then we just... Luckily, Dimitri and I are able to um, bounce a lot off of each other, and we'll just say, let's just make a gut call. Like, this doesn't feel right. And when we've gone against our gut, we feel like we've gotten burned. So, um, yeah. John? Yeah, you have to, you have to sort of like, like them on some level yeah. and respect them on some level. That's, that's, my, that's my kind of golden rule. If there was one thing that knocks them out immediately at that first meeting, what would it be? Knocks them out? Uh, defensiveness. Just them being really kind of um, protected and guarded and and sort of defensive about. Yeah, same. And just if they're coming to you with, you know, while well, I'm looking at four firms and they're if they're trying to like pit you against the others, then we kind of stay away from that. I, I'm going to just go back one step, if I may, Quick. just quickly, and say exactly what you said about you're not only a designer but you're a psychologist, and we all are. Everyone in this room, you're a marriage counselor and a psychologist, and there your clients are not buying a remodeled home. They're not buying pillows and furniture and kitchens. They're buying a lifestyle. They want to have a certain life that they've seen or experienced and they're looking to you to see are you that person that can give me the lifestyle that I want. But, but from your perspective, how do you know you've got a bad one? What's, what's a warning sign for you? Uh, too many clients or too many, too many other contractors, if it's more than three, we have Gone. some red flags. Yeah. Yeah. James? I, I think um, for us it's if they start negotiating right out the gate, uh, negotiating the contract terms, negotiating the retainer. If there's too much negotiation, it's not going to be good. What does that tell you? It tells us the whole process is going to be like that. Gotcha. I saw another hand up, but yes. Tools for for communicating transparency with the finances. Take pick a builder who works like he does. Um, you know where where you have transparency from from the get go. I think that it, it it makes the whole it lubricates the whole process. Trust is essential when you when you embark on this journey together and hopefully you never lose it or have to regain it but so you do it through the builder it's it is i think a, a lot of it really is is through the builder nancy so i think people think about interior design in this industry and that we're just picking out pretty fabrics and furniture and a lot goes behind 
it, a lot is behind it with spreadsheets and client management. So a, a lot of what we do is um, spreadsheets, putting everything in timelines. Um, do you show a, that to the client? We do, and have a, a Google Drive, um, and we have access to it, so we can update in real time and then meet with them on, on you know, a, a one day a week, and they've had all the information. I'll come to you last. I want to get to you last. Um, we show clients the net price. We tell them what our markup is. We also are really transparent in that process as well as we tell them that we will send things out to bid, we'll get multiple bids, or we'll recommend the right vendor for that style or that piece of furniture or for their budget. Okay, Sid, quickly. We go one further in, in that our, all our pre-construction work. So a lot of builders offer free estimates, right? They're not gonna charge you to, to create your budget for you, but everyone does. Everyone has to pay for budget development. And so we've chosen to put that in black and white and bill the clients hourly as much or as little as they need to develop their budget. That way they know exactly how much they're paying for budget development as opposed to the other model, which is a free estimate. Then once the, that builder gets a contract, they pad the bill with all of their estimating expenses. And so that contract is predicated upon a falsehood from the get-go. So we want to eliminate that as well. I encourage them to, to get um, preliminary pricing or, or the sort of pre-construction contract um, every time. And they don't always take it, but it always, it always helps. Because, you know, the, the market here changes so fast. And I had a three-year break between new houses, and the, the, my predictions for what things were going to cost were completely off. They had gone up 20, you know, 20% or so, and I didn't like being in that position all of a sudden, you know. Okay, uh, let's go over here. At, at the back first, and I'll come to you. Yes, sir. All right. The, the question is how involved is a designer in, in hiring the contractor? Yes? Let's start over here quickly. Well, it's a really tight network that we operate in. So it's in, in architects, builders, it's, it's really, um, a, really a referral system. Nancy, what yeah, about and you? We, we have our go-tos that a lot of um, clients will engage with us first um, as they're starting the design process, or, or first or along with the architect as well. And then we have our handful of go-tos um, in our area uh, as far as contractors go. And so we'll, we'll recommend them based on their budget. Um, so I'd say most... Most of our projects, we feel like we're coming in early enough that we can help um, help them look at the bids as well. I, I always tap um, my, my resources, which are interior designers and fellow architects to sort of um, vet builders. Um, but I have some uh, go-tos that I've worked with in the past and, and often we'll start with them if they're an appropriate choice. I'm gonna come back to the go-tos, but to the extent that you're bringing in designers or somebody else, what we do in our experience is often that we, about 40% of the time, we're the first point of contact, and then we will refer or recommend an architect and a designer. We find it's rare, but it's ideal when the designer's on board from the get-go. If you have the designer on board, the architect, the contractor on board, and, and clients sometimes are afraid, well, you know, if I, if I hire them now, it's gonna cost me that much more, and it absolutely will not. It will cost them less money. The project is more efficient, and Everyone, you know, through collaboration, you get a more efficient and effective project. But, you know, some people will listen to that and, and believe you, and others have a harder time with it. To all four of you, I, I heard this go-to list. I have my go-to list in my hip pocket. How do I get on your go-to list? Uh, experience is a big part of it when you work with someone and you have a positive experience and you see how they engage with the client. That makes for a good referral. But I've got to get the experience to have the experience. How do I get on your go-to list? Um, well, for example, I know some people will work on show houses and they will work with a contractor to do something in the show house or in a room. And that's a great starting place for designers just getting started. Sid, how do we get on your list? It's largely been through trial and error and making educated guesses and finding out that in fact we were wrong, making educated guesses based on referrals and, and other past right. experience and then we're right. Um, and, and you go back to the same well. We do, but we, we, don't, we never let ourselves get too comfortable with, with any one given 
subcontractor or architect design. Nancy, what about you? We serve as project manager a lot of times on remodels, and um, so having our go-to list is really important. And it's, again, there's a lot of the same contractors that we've worked with over and over um, that we know how they work. I mean, one contractor in particular we've worked with so many times, and I mean, I had no problem calling them up and saying, like, get over there right now. You know, I mean, I can be a little bossy, but to, to him just to make it, um, go along faster, so, um, but we have a very loving relationship. If there was one thing you wanted out of a contractor, somebody you worked with, what, if there was one characteristic above all else that, that made you want to go back to that, that firm or that person again and again and again, what is it? Where we've had some problems in the past has been the not meeting deadlines, giving the client uh, unrealistic expectations of when a project is so going to be done. Yeah, and so a lot of, I mean, some of the contractors that we work on the peninsula, they will, it's like feast or fa famine, so they'll take on a project, and they'll take another one, all of a sudden they have too many, and so we see that happen a lot, because they don't want to... But for you, it's timing. For, ti for timing, yes. John, what about you? I would say um, ones that pick up the phone first, and they call, and they ask you a question, they're staring at something that doesn't work, and they just call me wherever I am, and I just say, try this, do you need a sketch? You know, they, they want to communicate about it in real time. They don't want to just, you know, have it, you know, make, make their own best guess about it, and then, and then have it sort of- Responsiveness. Uh, very responsive. I had a question over here, no, no, question, yes? Yeah, I, I hold that, I mean, that's my next, let me rephrase the question. I, I want to look at the ideal relationship between builder, architect, and interior designer. The ideal relationship. How should that work? And more importantly, who leads? There's got to be one leader. There can't be, there's no committee here. Who leads? It depends on the, on the phase you're in. Well, then, then go ahead. Talk, kick us off. Um, well, certainly when all three are brought in roughly around the same time, I think that's where you're going to have the most success. And but that doesn't happen all the time, does it, it? It doesn't happen all the time. We just got brought into a project where, you know, we are having to look at the architecture plans to give recommendations. There's no thought as to furniture placement or will there be drapes or will there be Roman shades on this window. So ideally, early on, and we've seen, we've seen success where the architect sort of takes the lead um, in the beginning and we serve as a consultant, again, to the point that they're not being built all the, so many hours in the beginning in the um, plan uh, process. Um, and so we sort of come in, let us meet as a consultant, look over the plans from an interior design um, perspective. And then when the, when the contractor is brought in early, it's great to get their, their thoughts um, on how things are scaling and where things are going. But, so. James, go ahead. So uh, at the Wiseman Group, we always say that the architect leads the project. But what's interesting is there's an evolution that occurs. The architect is responsible for the, the building, the house, and they, they look at that and they see that as a primary responsibility. The builder is getting that direction from the architect in terms of uh, you know construction drawings and whatnot, and they're on site every day. But what ends up happening is the interior designer has the personal relationship with the client because we have to learn so much about their lifestyle. How many people do they entertain? How do they use the house? And we often end up having the closer relationship with the client. And through those evolution of meetings, the client often refers to us for that direction, um, even on architectural decisions and building decisions, because they see that we're understanding where they're coming from. You become the de facto leader of the of the of the job lifestyle quite, quite often yeah in terms of promoting John, promoting the lifestyle I, I would I would agree I mean if, in the in the times that I've um, been fortunate enough to work with people as talented as people at the Wiseman Group um, you know I, I have full trust in what they bring to the table in, in terms of speaking to the clients um, lifestyle their their sort of desires and, and what also sort of works, you know, I, I think I have a pretty good sense uh, for it after, you know, 20 something years of doing high-end houses, but it doesn't mean that I'm always right, and it doesn't mean that it's necessarily tailored to that client um, as as well as, as these other voices. So I, I really love having uh, a talented designer on board early in the process. I'm currently working with Catherine Kwong on a project down in Woodside, and, and she had done some work with that 
that owner and I insisted that she be involved. I insisted that because very early on because because she knew them because she n knew how um, they like to live but more importantly because I have a pretty good sense she was going to end up being the designer and I don't want the conflicts down the road. I want it to go smoothly and I want I don't want to have to move walls later. I, I want it to, to sort of all work together. You said you're the meat and the sandwich here but how, how do you deal with this? <laughs> Well, I've been, the I've been called is, is, right? You, what's that? The contractor is. Right. We're there from start to finish and after. And our experience has been that the best managed, the best run projects, the architect, well, there's input from all parties up front. I think we've beaten that horse fairly well. Um, but the project, as it, as it moves forward, the handoff of the input that we are getting and the input that we need the baton is handed off from architect to designer, not completely, but we have much more interaction with the architect up until we're ready for fixtures and finishes, and then at that point, the designer will typically provide interior elevation details and tile grout joint alignments and things like that, and so we have a lot more interaction with the designer as the project is nearing its, its finish phase. I, I come from a culture where we would say, if you pick the house up and you shake it, if it sticks, we want to draw it. So we would we would get um, uh, we would have our drawings be very very detailed and and cover all of that, but with all of the full input of the interior designer. And there are times when they will take some of those um, drawings on and develop certain areas. But just generally speaking, we would we would take that on. Question: Where is Ron? Ron, how much more time do we have? Oh, good. Questions from the audience on this issue? Yes. I've got a slightly different one. Um, budget. So I find that I have a hard time in the early phases of getting a client to tell me what their budget is. <laughs> How do you manage that? Right. The question is, you can't get a budget out of the client up front. How do you force one out of them? <laughs> we understand that, I mean, the fastest point, the fastest path to a meaningful construction budget is when the client will tell you, we want to spend this much and we can quickly tell them what you can have or what you can't have for that amount of money. But, but, but I get you, it. How do you force that? Right, but I get it because many clients, especially if they haven't worked with you before, feel like they're tipping their hand and that the builder or designer is going to go away and prepare an estimate for a penny less. So we don't push the issue. What we do is we give them the choice of disclosing the budget or signing up for an hourly negotiated contract for budget development. It takes as long as it takes until we're at the point they want it to be. So they'll tell us eventually what their budget is, one way or the other. It just takes a lot longer if we have to sort of work it out. We always um, let clients know that if they have a budget, we can work backwards from that, or we will prepare a budget based on what we think the vision for the home is and what the aesthetic might be. But it's also presented to them as a working document and, and that it's a draft and that they get to engage with it, and then we will tailor that. Because I often tell clients, I don't know what you value. Do you value hardware or not? Do you value light fixtures or not? Do you value per, uh, upholstery of a certain type? And then we tailor that budget to what they value. Now, yeah. bear in mind, this is coming from someone who the president of their company likes the saying, I'm the only one I know who can regularly outstrip an unlimited budget. <laughs> John? John? Uh, I was going to say that in, in the... Uh, in the development of my proposals to them, I tend to map out exactly what I think it will cost, and re regardless of what they they sort of told me, and, I, and of course we'll, we'll sort of uh, reference any number that they may have put out there, um, but I kind of run them parallel, and then we can we have something to talk about um, and and sort of discuss. So, so from the get go, they have some kind of sense that we're going to have to. Um, you know, refine it all and negotiate. And negotiate their expectations. So we find our clients that are in that mid-range, they're the ones that don't really have an idea of what budget is. The ones that have um, a, a smaller budget, maybe doing one room, they kind of know exactly what they can spend. And those that have very healthy budgets, there's a little bit more flexibility. So that mid-range, a lot of times they'll say, well, what, are, what similar size projects have cost for your other clients? Like what, and so we, we we have this over so many years of doing this um, pulled together. Just okay, this is what you know. A living room 
we've a client has spent that lives down the street from you or in your same sort of social circle. Um, and so, and then again, we ask them, what, what do you value? Do you value a beautiful rug? Do you value wallpaper? Do you, what are the things that are like, your, things that you really want, so. Final question, final question. Uh, I have the final question. The, think of uh, a recent situation where the dynamics have just worked beautifully between the contractor and the architect and the designer. It just came together, God touched this one, right? <laughs> and it all happened and everybody was happy and what made it work? Uh, I would say trust. You know, I, I, um, I have a client right now where they are walking into it. They've, they've done projects before. They've, they've put together a team that they trust and they don't have a lot of time to meet with us. They, they, they've kind of put out what they, they like and they wait for us to come back and they just seem to love everything that we've delivered um, because it's responding to what they want and, and they trust us. And it's- Trust us, us, us as the, the group, whole team, the whole the team. The interior designer, the landscape architect, the builder and myself. And we're there from the get go. How did you get that trust? referrals and no, but, uh, a really had, this this is a this is a singular job how did the trust develop it in was, that job it was, it was in our first meeting it was just our um the, the sort of camaraderie that we had me showing them the projects giving them some stories of things that um le lessons learned and um they okay they move forward it's, it's the, communi the communication though is really the how that gets established talk, talk about that when you meet with a client or prospective client, it's how you talk to them, um, what you tell them, the expectations how you talk, that you How set. should you talk to them? You have to be honest and, and you have to be realistic. And I think that's really important. And then you manage that throughout the entire process by informing them ahead of time, no surprises, letting them know that they're always in control, you're not spending their money without their approval, um, little things Honesty like that. Honesty and candor and transparency, yes? Right. Sit quickly. All of those, but I would add to that the principles, the architect, the homeowner, the designer, and the builder sticking to what they're good at and not attempting to overstep their bounds. And if we see that on bad projects all the time where with one of those parties may attempt to take responsibility from one of the other principles, which not only is, you know, it's insulting, it undermines the relationship, but if we, if we all stick to what we're really good at and focus on that, the, you know, in a, in a relationship of trust, it's It'll work. it has to be successful. You prop each other up, Nancy. I, I, again, I agree with all of these that have um, that have been said. I think that really the trust and transparency are are huge. And if the client knows that you have a great relationship with the contractor and they're um, in at work in the city, and the contractor needs to know wainscoting style, like you know yesterday and please over there just pick it i know i know it's gonna look great i trust you um so i think that they know they can trust you when you have a great relationship with the contractor and that in that day-to-day -day of you know going to pick where where are the outlets going to go go how high are they going to go and you're you're thinking for the client um that's i think that's really important but you have to have mutual respect among the team and with the client you have to respect the client for what they know and don't know yeah. and you have to respect each other member of the team for what their skill set is um their strengths and even their limitations and then support each other in that and you have to do your job you've got to provide the information that we need to build it right and we've got to build that on time and on schedule um you know trust is important and Sticking to what you know is important, but you have to do your, you have to really perform to, to prevent everyone else from not, you know, from looking bad, right? Would you please put your hands together for our panel, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our panelists will stay here for a little bit after we close today. If you have any projects you want to bring up, <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, what do we do now? Yes. All right, so any last minute uh, business cards to add to the drawing? <laughs> Going once, oh, there we go. <laughs> Going twice, one more. Perfect. Nancy, oh. Nancy's wearing such a gorgeous dress, I'm gonna let her pull our first pick. <clears throat> All right, 
Who do we got? Uh, Shelly Pintabona. Where's Shelly? <laughs> Shelly! <laughs> Shelly, your first pick. Light or dark? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, help a, help a Shelly out. All right, so now we're raffling off this set. And what's your name? Allie. Allie. Who we got? Natalie Love. <laughs> Congratulations, ladies. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to everyone who came out today. Um, everybody, big round of applause for our marketing team at the Design Center. Um, if you didn't get a chance to grab some um, food, uh, help yourselves afterwards. Um, take a look at our new showroom. Schumacher's launching new collections every month. We have a new one out that's so fresh we don't even have it up yet. It's uh, all uh, feather wall coverings, real feathers. So check it out. And thank now you guys. We have a pillow fight now, right? Oh, yeah.